I know I'm late on this one, but some of you have been asking for my verdict on the portrait of the Cambridges. Augusta Simone, please comment on the new portrait of William and Catherine revealed today. William, the future king, is evoking James Bond in his stance, and Catherine looks like his Bond gal. This is the best royal portrait I've seen in a very long time. Adventure and romance all rolled up together. Arm in arm. Augusta Simone? Thank you for your opinion. Uh, do I like it? Don't I like it? Yes, I like it. Yes, I like it. Uh, with a few criticisms, but only because I'm being picky. I mean, you know, if I walked past it, I'd probably adore it. Uh, uh, I also think that it's especially unfair to criticise art and portraiture without seeing it in the flesh, because as you know, seeing a piece in the flesh in a museum or hung in a wonderful gallery can transport you and take you to a completely different place than anything that the printed page can show you or a computer screen. So it's very unfair to judge in that respect. What stood out to me initially with regards to their faces is that Catherine's face in the portrait looks plumper than it does in the flesh. It looks like she's just been for a round of treatments with her cosmetic physician. It looks like she's had a bit of filler and something to the lips there, in my opinion. She is a little more narrow in the face in the flesh. And it's the opposite with William. I find in this portrait, from what I can see, he looks a little more aged, a little more sallow, and a little more thin around the temples. Uh, in the flesh, not, not the hair, uh, in that kind of area, in the portrait, as opposed to in the flesh, where I think he looks more hale. What I thought was really lovely about the pose uh, was the way that they managed to deal with the imbalance in height between Catherine and William, not only by putting her in heels, but the way that they were stood, the way that they were arranged. You see the kind of uh, diagonal lines between line between the the two heads at the top and the, the feet at the bottom they sort of put Catherine in the middle of William's stance to cheat that height difference which I thought was ingenious elegant and the lines were beautiful there and uh, some of you pointed out the fact that her gown looked somewhat obscene because of the way that the light danced on her dress and in particular around the areola the nipple area my dear the little sugar ice buns. Some of you pointed out that was a little obscene. But I actually looked back at some of uh, this Jamie Corrath's oeuvre. And I'll try and flash up a little bit of it here. Because I think it's important to put a piece like that in the context of the artist's oeuvre. And it seemed to be something that he likes doing. The gowns all have a similar feel and the way that the light hits all the ladies' gowns has a similar feel. Wonderful choice of gown, by the way, that gown by the vampire's wife. Modern and ele elegant. I think they very much achieved that ambition to have a sort of classical feel, but with a modern edge to it, you know? Uh, and that was accomplished very, very well, I thought. I would love to see it in the flesh, and I'm sure I'll get around to doing it at some point. I thought it was very clever how the artist caught their expressions, Williams in particular, uh, because he got a lot in there, a lot of that complexity of feeling and uh, a mixture of Williams' heavy responsibility and a sort of playful childlike element to his nature as well in that in that look that we see and recognize as William's look. After looking at the portrait it did begin to unnerve me with the decision for them to look off camera as it were. You know, I kept wanting to say look at the camera look at the camera. I am aware there was no camera there my dear I'm just you know coining the expression but I kept wanting them to move back to me to look at me so that I could get a really solid look at them but that's the artist's style and how he felt that he wanted to portray things so all in all I think a fabulous job really lovely a few things that I would have tweaked but I'm sure if I saw it in the in the flesh then I'd be very impressed with the thing but yes let me know what you thought welcome to the broadcast my dears it's Bona Tavaria Dolly Aldeek so settle yourself in and what do you think of my gown, my dears, with these wonderful wings? I think I'm going to flap, flap and take off somewhere exotic, don't you? Rather scintillating. Actually, I'm a little bit disappointed because you can't see it in its full glory when I'm sitting here in repose. It just looks like I've put some frock through a shredder, doesn't it? <laughs> but I assure you in person and when I'm pirouetting around doing my thing 
with the fanciful arms here. It's a ra rather fabulous, whimsical gown from the Vintage Fair. So it's a wonderful find. A uh, quick few seconds of housekeeping I want to do. One involves a notification bell. These are problems that are hitting all channels on YouTube, I see, and a few people have mentioned it, that you're not getting notifications when I post a broadcast. If you're not familiar, that little bell down in the corner there, I think it's that side down there, you just press it or click it and it'll send you a notification each time I broadcast. So, you know, only press it if you want those notifications. I don't think I um, receive notifications from any channels, but some of you want to know about it. There it is. The other thing is scammers, the latest scammer thing on YouTube, which is, has been going on for a while. Some of you will know about it. Uh, but I just want to give a heads up to those of you who are vulnerable out there. Please know that there are bad actors out there who will try to get your money, information, financial stuff, get you to open links, get you to download various things, send you, uh, try and involve you in WhatsApp messaging, and they impersonate our channels. I haven't noticed it on my channel at all lately, but I have been told that it's happened where uh, people take our profile photos, and our channel names and they sort of build a replica channel that looks like us but isn't us and they, they talk to you in the comments and persuade you into sending money or opening links. There's all kinds of uh, things they can get up to, my dear. So please, just have your wits about you. My only link is in my channel description when you expand under the video. That's my only link to my PayPal for those of you who kindly send me a tip for a cup of coffee or whatever, my dear. Uh, that is the only official one. So. If you get a reply from me, it might be from me, but click on the person's profile, check that it has all my videos uh, going back throughout the last year. And, you know, I'll do my best to try and look out for them popping up in the comment section. But, they're, they're, you know, one or two always slip through the net. So you just got to please, my dears, uh, have your wits about you. What more can I say? OK, that's over. So uh, the Hasselhoff. The Hasselhoff. Off to visit his neighbour, isn't he? Well, I say neighbour, apparently it's a five-minute drive to her. Montecito Enclave. And he took a convoy of cars with him to visit neighbour Oprah. He was behind the wheel of his black Range Rover with Meg in the back. Uh, apparently there was a baby car seat in the back. Now, I would have thought that would be for Harry because he's the most immature one of the clan, isn't he? I would have thought that baby seat would have been for Harry, goo goo gaga. But apparently not this time, he was in full force in the driving seat, man of the family, so alpha. But he was sitting next to somebody who people seem to be saying is an actress friend of the Harkles, what was the gal's name? Janina Gavanka. Janina Gavanka next to a wanker. What a wonderful vision. Uh, yes, this convoy of cars, security, security everywhere. <laughs> you know, this enclave in Montesera, don't you think that they should involve some kind of underground network between all these celebrity homes? That would save an awful lot of the paparazzi springing up and ambushing them all the time, wouldn't it? They had an underground facility. Maybe they already do. Then they could go and shuttle over to Oprah and Ella and Adele. I don't know what other, what other fanciful people are springing up in Montecito. I do know that I have people in the comment section who live in Montecito. and They seem to be very beautiful people. It seems like a lovely place. But those huge mansions, those huge uh, enclaves that they had, they look so lonely, don't they? I was looking at Oprah's and uh, obviously we see the Montecito one. And those huge sort of mini cities on their own. They look so empty and lonely, don't they? I mean, who am I to say? I mean, they might be filled with love and chuckles, but just look so isolating. But already questions are being asked and the rumour mill's gone into overdrive. Does this mean that we have Oprah 2 coming up, but this time with the spotlight on Harry? And Meg this time in the wings? ready to strike and make a move at some time during the segment. Because let's not forget, with this memoir, about to come out sometime in the not too distant, who exactly is the woman responsible for shifting shed loads of books all around the world for decades? Well, that's Oprah, isn't it? 
She's one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, voices in shifting copy. Isn't she? So it would be, I mean, only a fool would not use that kind of outlet for their merchandising. So are we to see Harry come into the spotlight? Well, I don't know, my dear. I would say the one encouraging sign, you know, press reports say that they stayed with Oprah for about an hour when they went to visit her. About an hour. And, you know, they did bring this actress with them. So I would have thought if they were going to discuss confidential stuff, potential show, it would be a bit less likely to if they were bringing somebody with them. I would have thought they would have kept that private. But who's to say? But as we discovered when Oprah interviewed Meghan, Oprah has no ambition as an investigative journalist. She has no ambition to get to the kernel of truth. And she excels as an entertainer, as a provider of entertainment in modern times. You know, going back in time when she had a talk show, uh, for which I'll always have an affection for Oprah. And I'll always give her the props for doing her job as somebody that has to pull in viewing figures, get the ratings and get the show syndicated. You know, from that perspective, she does her job and she does it with a plan. But we can't now seriously consider her a truth teller or somebody that's seeking the kernel of truth in any way. And the Harkles must feel very comfortable in this scenario now. They won't be quizzed too much when Harry comes and gives his side of any dealings that may be published in the memoir. It's also been revealed today that the Harkles have hired a director for their new Netflix show. An Oscar-nominated, left-leaning, surprise, surprise, <laughs> very left-leaning director who directed The Handmaid's Tale. Liz Garbus is the name of the person that will be putting out this garbage. And she was the one that was originally penciled in for directing Pearl. So after that was dropped unceremoniously, seems like she's stepping in for a new moment in the limelight, this Garbus woman. Now, this was quite an upsetting incident that's emerged this week, although it happened last year in the early part of 2021 during lockdown, I think, Prince William was recorded remonstrating with a man close to Sandringham, Anne Mahal, in the surrounds, uh, by what appears to be a, a man who is a drone operator and a photographer. He appears to hold official accreditation as a news gatherer. William was out having a bike ride in the vicinity with the family, with Kate and the kids, and it seems that there was an altercation caught on camera between William and this man. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't looked for the footage. Apparently it's a three minute piece of footage. Some of you will have seen it. I haven't looked for it yet. I'm not going to say that I'm never going to, but I, without wanting to sound holier than thou, it's not something that William wanted to be seen. So today I feel like respecting his wishes, but look, if it emerges on my YouTube feed at some point, curiosity might get the better of me and I might click onto it. You know, I've read some of the dialogue uh, where William was spitting blood, said that it was absolutely outrageous. And he said, how dare you behave like you have done with our children? How dare you stalking around here looking for us and our children? And it seemed like this chap told Prince William, oh, no, 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 I was just out. I think he said he was out looking for the Sandringham hunt or he claimed to have been there with some involvement in the in the forthcoming hunt at Sandringham, which doesn't ring true because this gentleman, if it's the one that is reported in the press, has been capturing sort of candid footage of the royals for a long time and uh, with no implication from me that this was illegal or whatever. I've got absolutely no idea. But it seems that William and Catherine, uh, because although Catherine and the children weren't filmed, she was heard saying, we are out for a bike ride with our children. We saw you by our house. And the implication is that the photographer was intent on catching the family, breaking our British lockdown rules, because it was shortly after they were accused of breaking rules for mixing with Edward's family at one point during the lockdown. And in this instance, one finds it very hard to come down on William for losing his temper mainly because it does involve his children. You know, it's only natural to be 
protective and territorial when your children are involved and when things like drones come into play. And for legal reasons, I must say, I have no idea if there's any implication that this chap broke the law or was doing anything that he shouldn't be doing from a legal perspective. I don't know if his behaviour was as creepy as William made it out to be. So for legal reasons, I'm just giving an opinion on what press reports are telling us, and that is all. But certainly from my perspective, if it was my kids and someone was hanging around, lurking around the house all day trying to capture something, when you're trying to go for an innocent bike ride, the heckles would certainly rise. And I've actually got a close friend of mine who is known, very well known, and who has a price on their head for photographs. Well, they expect, reluctantly, they accept and expect a certain amount of intrusion from the press. What they did not expect and what actually came to pass and chilled me to the core when I heard about it. I mean, this person lives in a fairly large house in large grounds, <laughs> not quite on the scale of the Montecito mansion, but not that far off, to be quite honest with you, but in one of the English shires. Well, thankfully, at this point of the day, they weren't lovemaking or wandering around naked, but but this person and their partner came to take a, a stretch at their Juliet balcony by their window. And there was a drone. A drone on their grounds, basically hovering outside this balcony, looking into the bedroom. And I, can, you, can you imagine the absolute violation that one must feel when that happens? And these create incredible problems in the modern age for figures like William and Catherine, because there's so much surveillance that can go under the radar. You know, it used to be that long lens, long range lenses were a huge problem, which they still are. But now there's all kinds of devices and contraptions and gadgets and surveillance equipment. And it's one thing for them to surveil Catherine and William, but when the three kids are involved as well and their movements can be followed, it must be overwhelming at times, absolutely overwhelming. And the very sad thing about it is, is that William has always been reasonable. He came to an understanding with the British press some years ago. And for the most part, the British press have been very respectful of the fact that they are provided with official portraits of the children at various times. And of course, now we're seeing more and more of them in public life, drip by drip, bit by bit. But there was always an understanding that there were certain times when the Cambridges were entitled to a private life, private moments, they give their entire lives to the rest of us. There is a code of conduct, a gentleman's agreement, if you like, between the press and Prince William's family, which has worked for both sides. And it's made William and Catherine less begrudging about providing certain access to them and their children at certain times. A fair arrangement, you know, what's wrong with a bit of fairness and decency? But if the press reports on what they're implying is true, then folk like this photographer who are lurking around where and when they shouldn't be from a moral perspective, even if they're entitled to from a legal perspective, making a family with their young children feel threatened and unsafe, well, shame on them. Shame on them. Wasn't it an absolute tonic to see Her Majesty at the ancient Ceremony of the Keys in gorgeous Edinburgh? This ancient ceremony marks the beginning of Holyrood Week. She was symbolically offered the keys to the city of Edinburgh, accompanied by the dashing Prince Edward and his divine wife Sophie, who was on hand in green. They are expected to meet with the First Minister Nicholas Sturgeon while they're there, and Nicholas Sturgeon is the First Minister of Scotland and she's pressing for a second referendum on independence. The first one, I believe, don't quote me, was 2014, where the people of Scotland voted to remain part of the Union with Queen Head of State, but Nicholas Sturgeon is pushing for another referendum, which would take them out of the Union, become independent. So the Queen made a surprise appearance using that soft power that we often talk about that she has. And it went down very well with the people of Scotland because it's important to remind the people of Scotland of the affection that the Queen has for the country. You know, she really cherishes Scotland with all her beloved memories from childhood onward there. Balmoral, the palace at Holyrood, which is worth a visit if ever you're in town. It's really lovely to shuffle through. 
But if it's true what they say about these episodic mobility problems regarding the Queen, perhaps she has good days and bad days. Well, it looked like rather a good day, didn't it? She was full of smiles, beaming. She was really making an effort and she looked spry. I saw her emerge from the car, sort of unaided and receiving little nosegays. It was really splendid to see her looking full of energy, full of life, and if she was in pain, hiding it really very, very well. And she looked beautiful in that outfit as well. Oh, she's popped up again today for a second time, meeting with members of the armed forces. Look at her in this absolutely delicious lilac mauvey thing with the little cranberry stones on the side and on the hat. That is absolutely exquisite. And look how healthy she looks. This is part of more celebrations to mark her Platinum Jubilee. It's never ended. The coat and the matching hat are all by dear Angie Kelly. And the silk wool dress is in a gorgeous shade of heather. Erin O'Brien said Camilla will someday be Queen Consul, which is lovely. But can you imagine being 75 and having no idea when your job will begin? It actually sounds a bit horrible if you are ageing like a normal person. And yeah, I wanted to read that out because it's food for thought, because we often forget that Charles is 73 and Camilla's coming up to 75, you know, thereabouts. And that this is the time when most people are settling down, isn't it? If they have the luxury of retiring. Uh, you know, it's the time when most people are settling down. And Prince Charles, who, whether you like him or not, has worked tirelessly his whole life. And we know that he's a man born to great privilege, but he also has the disprivilege. What's the opposite of privilege, my dear? I don't know. The unprivilege, the disprivilege, the misfortune. Opposite of privilege, disadvantage, handicap, disbenefit or drawback. Let's say the handicap. <laughs> he also has the handicap of the burden of great responsibility where everything rests with him and now the future of the monarchy rests with him. And the gag is that after a lifetime of work as the Prince of Wales, the gag is that the job hasn't even begun. It's terrifying when you think of it. His job, his true work hasn't even begun as monarch. And he doesn't know when it will begin. It could begin when he's nearer 80 or beyond. Who knows? Who knows how long the Queen's going to go on for? And Camilla as well, you know, at 75 is busy as a bee all over the place, gallivanting all over the world. What's it going to be like when they're 80s? You know, Prince Charles has got to keep himself in pristine health over the next few years. Otherwise, Big Willie's going to have to take on some kind of soft regency as soon as Charles ascends the throne at this rate, if he's approaching 80. This is going to be extraordinary times, but it only points to the relentless nature of monarchy, the absolutely relentless nature of it. And I guts to tell you that even though I'm a stickler for tradition and duty and I harp on about it all the time, you know, in 2022, with the gross invasion of privacy and the unwavering spotlight of criticism focused, and that's going to be focused on Charles and William, in a way that, as, as bold as that press intrusion may have been in Elizabeth's day when she took to the throne in her young childhood, this is on a different scale, an utterly different scale a misery making scale. And even though I'm a firm believer in duty, that kind of thing, I wouldn't blame either of those two for chucking it all in my dear, <laughs> in, in some ways. And I know that might shock you. And in times gone past, I would have frowned on it, but you know, I would find it quite difficult to blame them with as much vigor as I might once have done for throwing in the towel. I must also quickly mention my viewer, Susan Blake. Susan dear, you very kindly sent me a tip in the tip jar. So thank you for that, you're very kind, and everybody else who's done so is also equally as kind. So thank you very much. I'm just picking out Susan because your email address bounces. This happens occasionally, I get bounce backs. Uh, so your email obviously is an old one or your inbox is full, so you wouldn't have got my thank you. So I'm just thanking you here. I'll see you in the next broadcast. Thank you to those of you who have sent me a lovely tip in the tip jar. Ching, 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 ching. I'm gonna fly away, my dear, to the nearest disco where I can twirl and swirl and scintillate. <laughs> uh, if in doubt, apply glitter. That's 
my motto for life. I will catch up with you soon. Lots of love and toodle pips. <laughs> <laughs>